Good morning, everyone. Now, is the microphone working well enough? Can you hear at the back? Can you hear at the back? Yes. Yes. Microphone for the online. Can you hear all right? Someone give me a wave. That's fine. Oh, the joys of technology these days. We've just got to get it right. I think that's better now. Better now? Better now. Almighty God, You have taught us through your Son that love fulfills the law. Grant us grace to love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And to love our neighbours as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God now and forever. So now, let us worship God by singing together our first hymn, which is number 631. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Hymn 631. Please stand if you are able.
Let us pray. Living God, so teach us to know you through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in harmony with his will and share the power of his eternal life. We come together today to find pleasure in your presence, to remind ourselves of your truth, to bathe in the brightness of your word, and to enjoy singing and declaring our praise to God. Lord, when our faith is tested, in among sadness and suffering and anxieties of life, we continue to long for you, for you are the source of our truest happiness. You never forget us. We will continually praise you, our Saviour and our God. Lord, our Protector, save us from our sins, our neglect of prayer, of others, of the needs of the world, and hear us as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Most of you will know that um, I've been, I've had a great burden on my heart about the community and where we are at present in the church here. And for that reason, I put together a very basic, very simple little questionnaire sheet. Um, what I will do is, some folk have had these out already because I've just been passing them around as I find people. If you feel that, that you would be interested in filling one of these in for me, I really would be grateful if you would do it for me, please. Um, and the information that is gathered together then can go to looking further into the way that the Lord is leading us here in Kinloch Leven. Um, the question at the top is a very simple one. What kind of place should our church be? And what can we do for others? There's a thought. Um, I'll leave these out at the tea, um, tea time for later. And uh, if anyone would like to have one, please just take one, fill it in, and let me have it back any time. Thank you. A response to Christ in our devotion. O oh Lord Jesus, enfold me in your arms. Let me never be parted from your love. All my being and all that I possess, all my life is committed to you, Lord. Come and turn all my footsteps to your way. Let me never be parted from your love. Let your spirit always be in my heart and let only your love live within. Come and turn all my footsteps to your way. Let me never be parted from your love. Let me bring to you others who are lost. In their sadness, may they discover joy in believing their witness to your truth. Let them never be parted from your love. O oh Lord Jesus, enfold me in your arms. Let me never be parted from your love. Amen.
Sing once more and our hymn is 367. Jesus is Lord. Hymn 367. Please stand to sing if you wish. Chapter 9, 
Let us pray. Now, O Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for yourself. Lord Jesus, Amen. Not yet at the cross, but at the crossroads. Lord Jesus, you have looked at us in love and called out to us, follow me. And we have called back, I will follow you wherever you go. Sometimes we have said it without thinking. Or we have sung it with our mind elsewhere. We may have intended to go wherever he leads, but we find excuses to do anything but respond to his call. Jesus, who was moving towards Jerusalem, a journey synonymous with the cross, offers discipleship that is not easy to undertake. Not yet at the cross, but at the crossroads. Those who follow him must first count the cost, because they will share in his suffering. They must not give anything, even good things, priority over Jesus. The reading we heard from the Gospel this morning is a description of a journey. There is some discussion among experts as to whether it was one leisurely journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, or it might have been two journeys in total. But the theologian W. G. Kimmel sees it as a description of how the Lord, who goes to suffer according to God's will, equips his disciples for the mission ahead. The appeal to the Galileans is over. The passion lies before Jesus. He journeys steadily towards it. For until the end comes, he must continue his work. Not yet at the cross, but on the way. On the way Jesus encountered people with very human desires. People who were perhaps willing to be disciples, but they presented to him all sorts of delaying tactics and their characters are woven in and out of the conversation that he had as the group travelled. 
At that time, he spoke of the absolute commitment that he looked for in his followers, in sharing his homelessness and in placing discipleship above family and duty. And the necessity of following him was a degree of perseverance and loyalty. This was not an easy road to take. Each of the individuals was at a crossroads in their lives. And to take the journey with Jesus would be difficult and spiritually demanding in every way. Hardship appeared in many forms as the disciples walked with Jesus. Some of the Samaritan villages would not offer hospitality, causing James and John to want to lash out, but Jesus rebuked them for this. Their zeal and devotion to Jesus had obscured their understanding of how to treat others. Jesus did not require his disciples to be wrathful and fiery, but instead to be compassionate and to be caring. Not yet at the cross, but on the way. Not yet at the cross, but at the roadside. At the roadside, some well-intentioned individuals announced their intention to follow Jesus. Only the encounter, only to encounter Christ's teaching of wholeheartedness and a definite commitment. And some of these lessons were very hard to bear or to understand. But Jesus, for example, trusted his mother into John's care, for he knew of the need for people to take their family commitments seriously. He does not expect us to betray or willingly leave those we love in a bereft state, but he still does require of us a meaningful and dedicated commitment. The writer Paul Turnier tells this in his book, Escape from Loneliness. He says, There is a charming story of a little child who was learning to pray. When the child got to the part of the prayer, his mother had taught him that included the words, Lord, I surrender to thee everything I own. He abruptly broke off and whispered to himself, Everything except my baby rabbit. Lord, I surrender to thee everything I own. He said, Lord, everything except my baby rabbit. Paul Tournier goes on to comment, All of us have our baby rabbits. Sometimes it's an ugly thing, sometimes beautiful, sometimes large, sometimes small. But we are more attached to it than to anything else. But this is the thing that God asks of us and touches upon when we sincerely ask for the guidance of him. Of course, we encounter pitfalls and problems, especially if we fail in our commitment to Christ. And when we get to the stage where we say, I will do anything but. By the grace of God, however, every failure is an invitation to repentance and blessing. We wonder if any of the men described in our gospel reading gave up on their excuses and followed Jesus. I wonder what happened if they did. There was still so much for the disciples to learn and so much that could apply to how we live now. We believe that by following Christ, We may come to new places in our lives of faith. And if we learn nothing else from these words today, 
Perhaps we remember to appeal for grace, to follow him and to proclaim his kingdom and to learn just exactly what we should leave behind at the roadside, at the crossroads, on the way, at the roadside, we're at the signposts. From the account of the journey to Jerusalem, we gain a rich story of guidance and direction. And we heard how in Luke 3, sorry, in Luke chapter 9, three men are described, each one seeming genuine, but each harbouring a reservation, each coming to a point of decision. Which way will they take? Which way will they go? Perhaps one of the most challenging things we will ever learn from Jesus is his teaching that the kingdom has no room for those who look back when called to go forward. In verses 57 to 58, a man expressed his readiness to follow Jesus anywhere, anywhere. (coughs) But he had not reckoned what that meant. He offered to follow Jesus wherever. But Jesus offers only nowhere. Jesus had no hole, no nest, and nowhere to lay his head. And his disciples can expect nothing better. Philippians 2 verse 7 reminds us, From the beginning, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Jesus humbled himself at the beginning of his life, being born in a stable and cradled in a manger. In the same manner, he will humble himself at the end of his life, dying on a cross. In between, he focuses on ministry rather than personal comfort and expects his disciples to do the same. He blesses sacrificial ministry. For Jesus was travelling, and the way he was travelling on reflected the cost of the incarnation. Jesus was homeless until the completion of the agonising journey to his Father and his heavenly home. As for the man who asked to follow, perhaps he had not considered the sacrifices he would have to undertake and the changes that would occur in his life. Now, the second man in Luke's account asked Jesus for leave to perform burial rites. It's not exactly clear as to whether or not his father had even died at that point. By reading insightfully between the lines, Jesus knew that what the man proposed was, in fact, an indefinite delay, a tactic to deny and limit a heavenly calling was not to be allowed to get in the way of Jesus' urgent demands. Perhaps this situation implied that those not responding to Christ, those who were spiritually dead, could see to the correct rites of burial. For indeed, we read in Deuteronomy and in Psalms and all through the Bible that an unburied body was considered a mark of disgrace. And the burial of one's father or mother is an important part of honouring them by Jewish law. By Jewish law. <laughs> However, on the way to Jerusalem with Jesus, on that occasion, there was no waiting for grief or sorrow. For so much more grief and sorrow was yet to come. Not yet at the cross, but on the kingdom way. It may have seemed harsh, but the road was calling, and something that could be happening away in the future could not be used as an excuse to delay discipleship. 
course, a burial of one's father is an urgent responsibility, and an honourable person will not allow lesser responsibilities to intrude on it. But the one more important responsibility is that of proclaiming the kingdom of God. Verse 60, Jesus said, but you go, you go and announce the kingdom of God. Jesus challenged disciples to give kingdom proclamation top priority. And the third man, well, the third man was a person with conditions to consider. Perhaps not unreasonably. He looked to go on his way with Jesus, but wanted to say his goodbyes first. Hmm. I wonder. Who knows what other conditions he might then have manufactured? What excuses he might make? Or what causes might be found? To shilly-shally over the most important decision that one can ever make. The decision to follow Jesus. The second and third would be disciples. Ask for leave to take care of other priorities before beginning their discipleship. The first would be disciple, made no such request, but Jesus spotted in him, saw in him some lack of commitment. And Jesus said, No one, having put his hand to the plough and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Ploughing behind a raft animal is an exacting and difficult task. A farmer must control the plough with one hand and guide the animal with the other hand. He must walk, he must watch a fixed point directly ahead to plough a straight furrow. Looking back will cause him to lose sight of the fixed point and to lose control of the plough, causing him to plough a crooked furrow. We should note that some of the giants of the faith first offered excuses too and took their eyes from the mark before they finally accepted God's call. Moses, Gideon, Jeremiah, Isaiah and many, many others all went on wobbly, wobbly ways. And yet each of these people, however reluctantly, did what God asked and God blessed their reluctant discipleship. A friend of mine had a silver ring and this ring had lettering inscribed on it. It was something that was of very personal value to her. And being a curious sort of person, I asked about the inscription because I'd never seen one like it before. And my friend told me that it was of a spiritual significance to her because it reminded her of something special. I duly inquired further. Now what the ring had was a pattern formed of letters. It was a letter E but placed backwards. Then two capital T's and then a further E going the other way. So I don't know, the first T was the right way, two T's and then the last E was the wrong way. So it kind of bracketed like this. And what it meant in her tradition was endure to the end. E T T E. Endure to the end. Endure to the end in life, in faith, in family troubles. I admired the thought very much, and it reminded me once more of how much Jesus endured and the encounters that he had with the insincere, with the doubters, with the excuse makers and with the comfort seekers. Those he took on 
as some part of his very flawed and human band of disciples. But as he was on a way of endurance, he had much to endure, as they squabbled and questioned and wondered and wandered. Perhaps there was no more time to take on board the three hapless individuals described in the text. Perhaps there was no more time to argue the point. Perhaps they followed on later. Part of me would like to think so, for they symbolise for us the negatives of humanity that we all share and that can be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this gives us such hope. May we walk in Christ's way and follow in his footsteps and endure to the end. Amen. Friends, let's sing together the very lovely song that has been used for dedication in the church many, many times. Number 501, O Jesus, I have promised. May we walk in Christ's way.
Let us pray. Generous God, forgetful and ungrateful as we often are, for each gift we have been given, for family, friends and work, for peace and plenty, joy and laughter, lessons learned and courage granted. We offer now our grateful thanks for mercies received, hopes fulfilled, promises kept and love renewed. We come in faith and hope Acknowledging your presence with us, let our minds and our hearts be filled with stillness as we pray. Even when we think of the catastrophes of the world, the hearts of the Ukraine and of Russia, the pains of the bereaved, and as we remember the lost and bereft of this week. We come in faith and hope and we pray for the church in its many forms and gatherings that its ministries may serve faithfully the causes championed by Jesus enabling all into a deeper understanding and to be a light to our communities and the world. We pray for all families, especially those experiencing difficulties, that they may not be damaged through their suffering, but grow in compassion and understanding. We pray for those in pain and distress, for those who have been in terms and in times of long illness, for those who have been confronted by pain that they do not understand. May they be confronted with and comforted by and strengthened by Christ's presence, trusting in your love, which never fails. In thankfulness and praise, we remember all God's many blessings given to us each day. Help us to become more generously hearted and appreciative. Be pleased to accept the gratitude of our humbled hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our King. Amen. Our final hymn for this morning is number 704, Through the Love of God our Saviour, 704.
Go in peace. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve and keep you this day and forevermore. Thank you.